Y'all know me a little bit by now and know that one of my favorite things to add to my artwork is glitter. I really love that twinkly sparkly stuff. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. Today, I'm going to show y'all a little more behind the scenes on how I make some of the sculptures, whether it be the backlit sculptures or uh, just the non-backlit textured resin sculptures. And a little recap, this is the stuff that spills off the sides of my canvas. Let me show you how it's kind of peeled up. We've already like peeled up a lot of the, the bigger parts of it. Here's a piece that hasn't been peeled up. So it spills off the side of the canvas. If you've ever worked with resin before, you already know what I'm talking about. But for those who have not worked with resin, it literally just peels up off of the Visqueen. And most of it's very, uh, like these pieces are very thin and brittle. Whereas the majority of the resin is not thin and brittle like this. These are just smaller areas just look at this pile over here of uh looks like a big pile of crap but it's not this is not a pile of crap this is gold to be honest i've got so much of this stuff it's crazy i keep every bit of it now i used to throw some of it away when i was getting started because i didn't know what to do with it and then i started to think how this stuff doesn't break down or decompose in a landfill so i'm like it's so cool each one of these pieces has some character to it and usability it's just you got to figure out how you're going to use it and i'm sure you can come up with some more original ways to repurpose this material if you really try it this is how i repurpose it though and uh so i'll take a blank canvas and a bunch of clamps and some super glue or silicone i like super glue because it dries really fast and allows me to reposition and stuff like that. Now, every resin, every different type of resin that I use has a different quality to it. That's why I like to use a lot of different products. And so, you know, there's pros and cons to each one. This is actually spill off from art resin, which I've talked about in many previous videos. Super clear, really high quality resin. It has a really good shine to it, no matter what type of product you mix in to it. One of the downfalls is in this scenario, it doesn't cure up to be very strong. Even when it's in a cooler temperature and when it's uh, less malleable, it still doesn't have much backbone. So you could be doing a sculpture like this and if you're only clear coating it with art resin over and over again, it's not going to hold up, especially you get it in some sunlight or some heat and it's just going to melt into itself essentially and go, you know, uh, go into noodle mode and just fold in on itself because that's what resin does. So obviously you got to figure out a way to go around that. So the ways that I have found to go around that and make it hold up, make it substantial and to last essentially is to recoat it so many times until it's like rock solid and i don't clear coat it with art resin i actually use a different type of resin and it's made by u.s composites down in uh, south florida and you might have seen me working with this you might have not but it is also a two-part one-to-one -one ratio epoxy resin you can even tell that the hardener here has a little yellowish tint to it. So I go really light. This is the type of resin that you would never want to use on a white painting. It's going to yellow. It's going to look like crap. But if you use it strictly to clear coat and strengthen your sculptures, you'll be glad you used it because this stuff allows it to hold up in heat and other... Uh, you know, harsher environments or even just like regular environments. You know, if you want it to last over time, you want to clear coat it with this stuff or a comparable product. I'm sure there's other products out there that would get the job done too, but that's what I use it for. And uh, I'll make an ask to the audience, anybody who is well-versed in different varieties of resin, if you have another product that you feel is superior to what I just showed you and you think could actually hold up uh, as an agent to, to allow it to withstand heat and 
keep form for longer, something that's gonna be really, really strong when it cures, drop it in the comments, leave us a recommendation, and I will buy some and play around with it. And uh, we'll find, uh, hopefully find some new products to play with. You know, I love experimenting, so that's how I come up with all my stuff, is just trial and error and trying new things. So yeah, bring on any suggestions you got. So enough about that. I'm actually gonna get to work. I'll show you how I do this. I've already clamped a lot of these pieces to this. I've used super glue to clamp it, and it should hold, should. If not, I just glue it again. And this is just like a temporary hold, like that one little bit of super glue is not gonna keep it holding form for long enough. Do you wanna clear coat this thing again as fast as you can, uh, like within a day? to keep it from like doing weird stuff and folding in on itself. But really, it's, it's just a layering process, same as the other uh, resin work that I do. So basically, I just keep going with this stuff, using a little Gorilla Glue, super glue. I'm sure Crazy Glue will work good. That, uh, the epoxy adhesives that they make are also really good. Like Gorilla Glue makes a really great epoxy adhesive and it's a two part system just like the other stuff, but it is literally a quick set. It sets up in like, I wanna say they make a, a three minute version, a one minute version and a five minute version, but yeah. So also I'll show you more of these. These sculptures, I don't necessarily know that these are done, when they start getting larger, they get a little crazy, especially like the return off of the side of the wall. It's not a very clean aesthetic. There's definitely better ways to frame these out to make them look like they fit. But really, I've noticed that when I keep them on a smaller canvas like this one, they just, they fit the wall better. They're way easier to place. I've done some very strange installations with these that I'll share. Uh, Maybe we'll share them as like a slideshow at the end of the video just to show you. Or Mikey can pop them up on the screen. I'll show you this backlit thing in here too. And you might have seen this from one of our last videos where this, this thing was backlit. Um, and the panel, the backlit panel that was on behind the plexiglass here, this thing was all framed in when we went to install it, it installed beautifully. The thing looked beautiful. It was great for about a day. And then uh, the panel burnt out, it fried out. So after doing a little, uh, a little digging, we found out that the electrician had actually hooked up the wrong voltage ballast, which is a big problem and it pretty much fried the panel out. So, and this is one of the only sculptures like this that I've done where I engineered it, where I couldn't easily change the panel without demolishing the frame. So we finally got done with that. We've got the new light panel in and we're gonna be putting it on the back and then building the frame around it and slapping it back up on the wall with a new ballast, the correct ballast, and uh, moving on to the next project. As a matter of fact, the client that I made this for also has some other walls that I really want to make some artwork for, but I, I don't want to move forward on anything until we finish this one project right. And this thing actually was made to go in a bathroom, a really nice bougie bathroom. It's a very expensive sculpture, but it's got like this really nice glow to it where if somebody's just sitting back enjoying uh, a hot bath on their vacation and they can just sit back and enjoy the glow from this piece. So that's what I made it for, for that specific bathroom. And uh, we'll share that when we go and, and redo the install. But yeah, same, same way that I make this stuff this is the way I make this. Only difference is it's attached to plexiglass instead of canvas or another substrate that's non-translucent. And, and there's a lot more that goes into these two simply because it's backlit. We want it to have the right color glow. So to engineer this right, you know, if you're not building this with the light on behind it, you're really doing it in the dark. 
and you can't create this type of stuff in the blind, you just can't. So while I was creating this, as well as any other projects that I do that are backlit like this, I have the panel turned on like in a plug and play type setup. And then I put my plexiglass down and then I take this stuff and glue it down to the plexiglass for the first few pieces, recoat, seal it in. And then I go back and add a couple more pieces and then recoat, recoat, recoat. And I let the edges wrap the plexiglass because if you've ever worked with resin and plexiglass, you know how easy it is to delam. Um, and what I mean by that is it'll literally start to delaminate from the plexiglass. So the trick with that is to let the resin wrap the edges just a little bit. And you're gonna have a little bit of drips, just like on canvas, you know. And on canvas, you would just sand the edges down. And typically, the sides of the canvas still have enough grip to keep it from delamming. Well, plexiglass does not. You give it just a little bit of room to delam, and you're gonna have a problem. So you wanna keep it wrapped. And just, if you do have to sand, keep it minimal, because you want it to, to retain the lip that, that wraps the edge. And uh, yeah, okay, back to the other studio. So one thing about these is they're very tedious, as you can tell. Uh, they require a lot of energy and a lot of time, which I like taking my time on my art, uh, you know, but it can be frustrating at the same time. There's definitely a limit to how much time I want to spend on a piece, but it's fun. Obviously, I have a lot of fun with this stuff and you can do a lot of cool stuff with it and bend it and reshape it and glue it down. Speaking of, where's my glue? I'm excited about this piece though because I haven't made a lot of pieces using neon. As a matter of fact, I haven't really ever painted with neon until recently and it's been a lot of fun just breaking out of my usual routine. I super glue and I clamp. And I always clamp it twice. That way I know that the area in between these two spots does get flat. Instead of like this and only have one little point of super glue, it actually has space where it's able to grip. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, you can see we're starting to get some form to it now, some shape. And now I can just build off of this. And if I come back tomorrow and I don't like some of it, guess what? I can just take it back out. Yeah, I might have to like pull on it, snap it, break it a little bit, but that's part of the process sometimes, not always. It's not ideal, but you know, I do that if I need to. And you can't do that with paint. At least it's not recommended by me. So yeah. You know, I really feel like this type of sculpture too, it's great because it's upcycled. You're not wasting any product. It expands your horizons. There's so much stuff you can do with this. You're literally working in 3D instead of 2D. So my mind goes crazy with this stuff. Like I really want to start creating massive pieces using this stuff to do crazy sculptures. Only thing is, uh, I probably need to implement another medium as a frame. Say I wanted to do like a, a horse or something out of this, make some type of a big animal or something and build it all out of resin. It's not going to be able to, to hold up under its own weight. So you've got to have some type of a skeleton to adhere the skins onto it. So uh, in the future, I'm gonna be playing with that. And I'd love to collaborate with somebody. If you know anybody out there that's interested in collaborating on a sculpture like that, maybe for a community project, especially if they're in the local area or close enough, connect me to them because I'd love to chat, love to talk. So yeah. That's where it is so far. I'll try to make my two separate points so it's got enough grip. Super glue is nasty stuff also. You see how this guy right here just wants to keep coming undone? I don't know if that's gonna work. It doesn't want to pinch together. 
You see that? See what I'm talking about? Uh, that might work. Stay. Come on, man. Stay. I think that might stay. Total pain in my ass. Like I said, tedious. Tedious. But worth it. Totally worth it in the end. And the thing about these two is you really want to be able to walk around the whole thing and see it from all the angles because you never know which way somebody's going to view it at. You know, you want it to look good from all sides. It's important. Well-rounded piece of art, you know. Especially if you're wanting to do a realistic subject. You want it to look like whatever. Yeah. Does it look like that from all angles or not? Then again, there's that art that's out there where it'll be like, I don't know what you call it, but it'll be like a hummingbird. And then you look at it from the side and it's like a bunch of trash stuck together. But when you like look at it from this one angle, it looks like a hummingbird. I think I got it. Cause there's like a little bit of a lip to grab onto right there. I think there's better ways to use that piece. I don't know if I want to add that piece in there or not. I don't know. It's pretty cool, isn't it? That piece. See, this is what I mean by like trial and error and being able to like remove something, but I want to always cover the edges. So I'm always trying to figure out the ways that I can cover the edges. At the end of the day, it's all those like small, tiny little pieces that finish it up. Like that corner, you know, like stuff like this and that piece to fill in that gap. It's like a ton of those little things to finish it all off. At least that's how I do my thing. You do your stuff how you want to. All I can teach is what I know though. So don't get mad at me if you have another way to do it. It's kind of like a puzzle, you know? And I think on this type of work, the more color, the better. Because they're small. Oh, here's a rule of thumb. At least this is uh, kind of what I do with my art. I have noticed that size, uh, size differences fluctuate. Let me start over. I have noticed that if I'm making a really colorful piece, it doesn't have to be as big for a wall as a piece that is lighter tones would need to be to fill up the space properly. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but if a piece, for instance, say I have this piece right here on a wall, and then I have this piece, same size. This is the same size piece as what's on the wall there. Now watch what happens when I put them side by side. Which piece demands all the attention? Well, I'm sure you guessed it, right? Okay, so what's your point? So my point is that like, you don't have to make as big of a piece if you're working with a ton of color to get a dramatic effect. It can be a substantially smaller piece that's still gonna demand a lot of attention. So this comes in handy when I'm selling art and I have a client who has a smaller budget to work with, you know, and they're open to my suggestion and assuming they like color to begin with, I will always propose to use more color and stronger color and lean into a smaller piece that I could charge less for to give them uh, the ability to afford one of my works, okay? I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense? Cool. The thing around here though, locally, is most people don't like a lot of color around here. And the reason for that is we're in a very coastal second home market. A lot of vacation homes here. A lot of properties on the rental market. So everybody wants the same thing. It's like all very light and coastal, which, you know, it's beautiful. It really is, but I like to do different things and mix it up. So the thing that I don't get to do a lot of is more colorful stuff to begin with. So in that setting or with more vibrant art, I've noticed that a really nice market for more colorful items is like Miami, New Orleans, certain parts of New Orleans. Um, 
I would say New York, Atlanta, LA, anywhere where modern is more prevalent, like modern architecture and modern design is more prevalent, more colorful works are also gonna be more prevalent because they're more compatible with the different styles of architecture and design that you see in those communities. So it makes sense, right? One thing uh, that's really popular in a lot of places, but specifically South Florida, like Miami, is pop art. And a lot of pop art is extremely colorful and vibrant. Anyway, I don't know that it needs the blue. It's not about needing, though, is it? I kind of like it without it. That might be one of those last little details that I throw in. Or even throw it in on the side to kind of hide it. I don't know, this is such a cool piece. I kind of want it to be in an area that really stands out as like a focal point, you know? Like this. That would be kind of cool. Where's my super glue? In some settings, you don't need a lot of super glue. Other settings, you need a lot more. All right, getting really close for this piece. And, uh, you know, obviously it's gonna have to be cleaned up around the edges and some added stuff in there, but we're gonna go ahead and move along to the next canvas here and start working on it. I'm trying to do like a series of a bunch of these. I've got a bunch of these small canvases and I've got a bunch of the spill off and uh, it would be really cool to be, to have like nine of them make up one big square piece, kind of. At least that's what I was thinking. Damn, don't want to get paint on the paint, damn. So the first piece that you add here needs to be something that has some curve and, and malleability to it. Now you probably saw me pick this up first, but this is a thick piece, like that doesn't want to bend. Same thing here. That, that piece is pretty stiff. It doesn't want to bend or curve. So I'm going to move to something that I can like round out and make some smooth edges because everything is going to be built off of that first piece. So if I can make my form using the first piece, even if I can clamp it on the side too, if I can clamp it on the side and get some different curves out of it, I would prefer to do that. And you might be thinking, well, why is that? Honestly, I, I can't answer you really there. I just like the way it looks when it wraps from like, it looks like it's coming out of the wall and back onto the canvas. It's just a different look. So I'll start by super gluing the edge here. Okay. And then I'm going to clamp the sides. And remember, clamp it in more than one place because the maximum amount of surface area that is down, maximum grip you're gonna have. And you need it to be strong. You need it to be as strong as possible. And on this one, I actually have the luxury of wrapping it on two different sides, which is pretty cool. So I'm gonna do that. It's gonna save me from having to take so much time on the sides later. And keep in mind, I am just winging this. Okay, there is no right or wrong with art. As I say a lot, it is just having fun, right? As long as you're having fun with it, that's the main thing. And let me tell you, let me explain that a little more in depth. When you have fun, when you're creating something, you're putting that energy into what you're creating. And a lot of people, a lot of people think about energy, I think wrong. Some people, Think about it, I think about it. Uh, what I mean by that is it's hard to see with your eyes the energy that you put into something in most cases. But with art, I truly believe like art is one of the easiest things to see somebody's energy, their state of being when they're creating. Cause like when you create art from like a, a dark place when you're processing or whatever, it might not be the prettiest shit. That's okay. When you create art from a place of joy and passion and just like you're having fun with it, people can feel that in the finished product. They can. So I think, how do you apply that? 
You apply that by remembering to have fun while you're creating. Don't be thinking about money. Don't be thinking about the end result even. Just, just think about, just be in the moment. That's it. That's where it's at. That is where it's at. I'm gonna glue this down and glue that down. One other thing that I'll probably go back and do is actually go back through and cut a lot of the edges here, like the stuff that passes, passes uh, over. If I can't glue it down, and I'll also go back and like paint some of these interior edges to match the color so it doesn't look like there's like trash glued to a wooden frame because that's not a like real clean look. I think that's probably the trickiest part of working with these types of sculptures is cleaning up the edges enough to where they look good on the wall. Not like that. That one does not look good on the wall because of the way the edges just jut out. I think it looks like crap. So I'm still working on that. That small one, I think it looks good. I think the way uh, the return is from the side, it looks better, it looks cleaner. Don't you think? I like that. We've got a photo shoot next week with a local magazine and a well-known photographer here in the area is going to be doing the photo shoot and I'm really excited about it because I've never actually had the pleasure of working with this guy yet so it should be fun I mean we've had a lot of different magazines shoot do photo shoots over here at the studio and over at the office and things like that but they all kind of look the same, so we're going to actually put in some work and try to change some of the art up at least before the photo shoot. It's very important to change the look of things from time to time. And, uh, but not too much. You don't want to do it too much, but, you know, if a client hasn't seen your space in six months and they come in and it looks exactly the same, that's a problem. For one thing, you should be selling stuff and moving it. And uh, if not, you need to be moving stuff around and making it look like you've been you've been selling stuff. You don't have to do that, but um, you know, sell sell some art, right? Move it around. Get some uh, get some stuff popping. That's cool, right? And yesterday, I had to put my dog down which really sucked. So today I am taking time to paint what I wanna paint. I'm not working on any projects or any paid projects. I just decided to take the day to paint what I wanted to paint and not really even focus on much business today because I'm a little unfocused. Where's the glue? Do you see the glue? I have lost the glue. No, that's not the one. I see the cap or I just, there it is. Boom. And for anybody else who's ever had to go through that and do that, it is really tough. It is a tough thing to do. And you know, I've thought about it for so long. I knew it was coming. Shit, I knew I was gonna have to do that right when I got the dog. I, I immediately started dreading of that day. So the whole time I've had this dog, I've been dreading that. And uh, then when it happened though, it was just like, I hadn't even seen the dog for like a whole year and a half since she bit Scarlet. So it was a lot, it was a lot. Uh, we sent Sugar Bear to live with my ex-wife and my two older daughters after uh, that incident where she bit Scarlet on the face because she couldn't live at our house anymore. She had to go. But soon after that, her legs like just totally went out. She's always had bad hips. German Shepherds have horrible hip dysplasia to begin with. And yeah, so I kind of knew it was going to happen one day. It got to the point where like Zoe couldn't even, uh, had to help her use the bathroom because like when she would poop, she couldn't like move away from it. So it's like, that's not a fun way to live. You know what I mean? For the dog or my ex-wife. You know what I'm saying? 
So she's in a better place. Because this thing's really cool, I think. I just kind of want to lit up. Roll it into itself and make it do this triangular shape up top. You see it? It's gonna be cool. Yeah, man, so for me, painting is, like I said, it's literally my therapy. When shit happens to me, I like to paint. That's what I like to, that's how I like to process shit. And I've always been that way. Even before I painted, that's how I would deal with my shit. When I was a kid, I would play guitar, I would play music, which I was also self-taught in, you know? I was just like kind of played by ear. Never really played covers. Uh, or even really knew how to play chords or... I played tablature, you know what tablature is? It's like one of the easiest ways to read guitar, really. It's like it shows the fretboard and like the different strings and then it's got a number for what fret on what string where you put your fingers and stuff. It's called tablature. Anyway, I kind of picked up on it using that too when I was younger, but really I just kind of played around and really just enjoyed messing around and experimenting with effects and all that stuff. And that was, that was my main creative outlet my whole childhood for the most part. That was what I really enjoyed doing. Yeah, that's pretty cool actually. I don't know, I kind of was like, I don't know if I want to layer that much up on there, but it's calling me now. It's calling me. It says I should do it. I like how it looks all sideways. It's cool, right? Obviously, I still have to clean it up and do all the stuff to it, though. It's like butter. I think she's looking pretty good. All right, we need a third canvas because I, I want to make it at least a minimum set of three, possibly a set of four or five or nine, like I said when I started the video, because these are cool, man. I really like these. Probably sell them for around, I don't know, something reasonable, like 800 bucks a pop. It's not that bad. I mean, any of my other sculpture pieces that take me forever to do, I charge a lot of money for them because I have to. My time's valuable. I value my time and I expect other people to value my time too. That's one thing about it though. Uh, if you're trying to sell your art and you don't value your own time, how do you expect a customer or prospect to value your time? Think about that for a while, you know? Anything that goes unspoken that you believe, people can still pick up on it. Even if you don't speak it, if they don't hear it, they can feel it. We're all connected like that. So it's really important that you do whatever work on yourself that you need to do in order to become the best version of yourself as an artist and a salesman, somebody who can actually market your own product. There's this belief in the industry that you can't be good at art and be good at sales at the same time. And this kind of like is entwined with the whole story of the starving artist, which everybody's heard of. It's super common in the industry for artists to get taken advantage of by customers, by vendors, you know, it's just common. It's super common. It's been that way for a long time because there's all these talented people that are amazing artists, but they never put any time and effort into developing themselves in the business aspect of art. And, you know, there's no rules with art, but there are rules in business. So I think that mindset, us two things might seem abrasive, those polarizing things might seem abrasive to some people who just want to stay in the art and not in the business. But from my experience, when you decide to level up your professionalism and become the type of artist who can sell your own work and who truly believes in themselves and truly believes that their work has value, that's when you're gonna start seeing big changes, big shifts, and it happens fast. It doesn't have to be some slow grind, but it really all starts 
with the mental aspect and really working on yourself and your belief in yourself and like your self-worth, self-image and because your art is a reflection of you and how you feel about yourself. I know that might seem a little deep or whatever to some people, but that's what it is. That's what it is. When you start truly valuing your own work, other people will pick up on that. They can sense it. They sense it in the level of certainty at which you present your work. When somebody as a prospect would come up and ask you uh, about your work, if you're not confident about it or if you don't like a specific piece that they're asking you about, you're gonna let them know with your body language, with your language, with just your energy. People, people can smell it, people can feel it. So, uh, the advice that I would give someone who wants to sell more of their art is work on these things, work on yourself, work on your mindset. That's the first piece, that's the most important piece, honestly. You know, from there, you can actually learn all the rules in business that you want and learn principles and strategies that you can apply to your art business. But if you don't have the mindset piece figured out and put in place, you're really wasting your time. You're gonna be spinning your wheels. I, I struggled for years to gain traction with my art in the industry. And I tried everything. It wasn't for a lack of uh, drive. Absolutely what, I was giving it all I had, but I kept seeming to self-sabotage and like crap would come up and roadblocks would come up. And uh, I couldn't understand why. It was like I was on the cusp of success so many times, so many times. And then right when I was at that point where I would never have to do anything other than just focus on my art, the whole thing would fall apart and crumble. And I didn't understand it. And when I figured out that I was running a scarcity mindset instead of an abundance mindset and actually understood what that meant and like did something about it, it clicked overnight. It clicked so fast. My life changed within like a week's time. I took a course, uh, I'm sure a lot of you people know who Bob Proctor is. Bob Proctor is no longer with us. He died over COVID essentially during that same time span as COVID. And uh, anyway, Bob Proctor had a program and I'm sure it's still out there. It's called Paradigm Shift. And I took my last $300, or it was like maybe 250 or something like that. I don't remember how much it was back then, but uh, my girlfriend was like, you need to do this Paradigm Shift seminar by Bob Proctor. And I was like, babe, that's all the money I have right now. I don't have money to spend on stuff like this. She said, well, if you don't, you're gonna stay stuck. And if you actually will do this one thing and get your mind right, everything will click. Anyway, she kind of pushed me into it and convinced me to do it. And I was like, I was kind of pissed that I did it. When I first entered the program, I was like, God, I just spent my last money. I got child support coming up. I've got to eat. I've got to survive. What am I going to do? I don't know. So I'm pissed and I'm frustrated. And, uh, but by God, I was going to get something out of the program at that point. Cause I just spent my last pennies that I had my last money that I had on this program. So you can guess uh, that I was very much glued to that program for the next three days. I was like, I'm going to get every bit out of this that I can. And I fully engaged with it and it changed my life so fast. In the three days that it took to take the course, the entire year previous to that, the amount of money that I made, I made that same amount of money in the following like 10 days that I made the entire year previous to that. I think it happened so fast. And from there, everything just kept taking off. It never slowed down. And the only thing that changed was my mindset. That's it. So I say that to show you that I, I believe in this stuff. I'm certain it works because it's worked for me. So go check it out. There's plenty of programs like this, but if you don't wanna search for other programs, Paradigm Shift by Bob Proctor, it's a good one. If it's still out there, it might not be, but yeah, I'll keep going.
Where's my water? Once you have your mindset right, you can really start focusing more on the principles of business and strategies that are gonna help you get to where you're going. And a lot of that education that I'm talking about, I have had a really hard time when I was coming up trying to find content based on art business specifically. Um, other than generic stuff that didn't really provide much value to me, it was kind of just like the same stuff over and over again that I would hear. And it's the basics. Not, not that it's not valid, it is valid, but I just felt like there should be more content out there based on business and uh, with art. So I decided to create it myself. I created a curriculum. It's called the Entrepreneur's Blueprint, and we've got the ebook out now. You know, go check it out. We'll link it down in the description. And we've also got the course coming out here probably in, a, in the next few months it'll be done. It's a video module course, and we're still, uh, still working on it. it it's gonna be really great. But you know, if you wanna go ahead and start learning some of this stuff now, go grab your copy of the ebook. And uh, it all starts with your education. If you wanna sell more of your art, go learn. Anyway, I'm certain it'll work for you. It's worked for me. Also, and just to clarify, the strategies and lessons that I have put into this book, The Entrepreneur's Blueprint, these are the same principles and strategies that have helped me sell millions of dollars worth of my own artwork. Millions of dollars, okay? Uh, it's not some cookie cutter generic stuff that you could find anywhere on the internet. This stuff that's in this book uh, is not super widely known. I don't think, maybe I'm wrong on that, but I haven't seemed to find a lot of the content in other places and uh, you know, it definitely will provide you a return. So it's got, uh, it's got a lot of value to it. This stuff really has to get glued down. You gotta glue it down really good at first because when you add the resin, if it's not already like touching the substrate or whatever's in the, the back of the canvas, in this case it's wood, if it's not actually touching anything, it won't have anything to hold onto and grab onto. It's very important that you spend this time to get this attached because if not, you can't really build much on it. You're about to use this super glue up, maybe get one more little, one more little, whatever out of it, that should be enough. I didn't really get a whole lot of bend out of this one, you know? I feel like I need to add, add some jump to it, some jump off so it can compete with these, or complement rather. I need some like flexi pieces. That's a cool piece, right? It's kind of brittle, but uh, I like that. These are always tricky to glue down though. You know? Yeah. Give me a clamp. You gotta glue the shit out of this to get it to stay. But then, once uh, it's just gotta hold up to the weight of the resin. And then when the resin cures, you're good. I can't hold this one up. You'll have to look at it like this, but yeah, were you able to see it? Yep. Kinda. Now I think those can hold up and stand on their own. If you're actually looking at on top of them. So now we're at the we're at the time in the session where I'm kind of done placing all the base pieces, and I will continue to add more and clean up the edges and make cuts and stuff. But now it's time for me to clear coat and seal in the work that I've already done. Now the super glue will hold it well enough to uh, let me clean up. Sorry, it'll hold well enough to let me seal over it and get a really good solid hold on all of it, but it won't hold it forever. So it's always best to go ahead and get that work in there. Something I always like to do is at least cut my edges here, trim the edges. There is a reason for me doing this, of course, this 
any like overhang that's just unnecessary, I'll go ahead and get rid of it now. And also, I know early on in the video, I talked about the US Composites resin to do the clear coat. I only use that on the final clear coat. The first sets of clear coat, I will continue to use art resin. Now, why is that, you might ask? Well, for one thing, it's clearer and you can do multiple layers without it turning colors. And I still want the piece to be malleable tomorrow when I come in and add to it. I still wanna be able to work with it. It's crucial that I be able to actually bend it and do what I, bend it to my will and do what I want. So I wanna make it look a certain way, right? So trying to do that with the US Composites resin, not so easy at all. Trying to get these last little sections glued down and trimmed up. See, like I said at the beginning of the video, stuff's tedious, very tedious stuff, but worth it. All right, now, I have all of those edges trimmed. Now we don't need a ton. We just need a little bit of resin. We do not need a ton of resin for this. We just need a little bit. Also, if you want to pick up some art resin, like we use, link down below, go check it out. I think that looks better, you know? to have all the edges be uniform in color. This is a smooth paint, dude. Woo! I just picked up some of this stuff. I've been experimenting with new uh, spray paints. It's a company uh, called Ma Montana that makes this spray paint and they make a bunch of really cool colors. Um, yeah, this specific color is acid green. And anyway, I just bought a bunch of these. I only have like two cans in so far, but uh, I can tell you this, I'm gonna keep buying this product because it's really smooth. And it's hard to find really good spray paints that have good color to them. Anyway, so I will uh, try to find the link where I purchased this and, and link it down below for you. I bought a whole kit of, I think it's, it comes with like 20 different spray paints, or maybe it's like 24. I think it's like 20. And uh, anyway, I love it. I like a good can of spray paint, especially something different. And like I said, it seems to be pretty high quality. And you're gonna see me wearing a mask a lot more, or an actual respirator like this one, a lot more in our videos because uh, I need to be setting a better example. So anyway, and full disclaimer, we do have very good ventilation in this room. We've outfitted the studio with uh, some really good, what do you call them, inline fans. Filters everything out, pumps fresh stuff in, but uh, you know, the more protection you have, the better, so yeah. So now, I'm just gonna start clear coating everything and I'm gonna go really slow with it. What I like to do is just dip my hand in it and drizzle it. Pouring, I tend to go too fast with it and kind of waste product where I don't have to. Now, just a reminder, I want to coat the entire thing, the entirety of the painting, all of it. So I start at the top and let it drip down. I will work it in with my hands. Don't forget the sides. You want it to wrap the entire canvas, sides and all. That's what's gonna make it stick and uh, have a, a really tight grip on it, okay? And look, if you miss a couple places, not a big deal. This is not the only time you're gonna coat this thing. It's just the first. So you wanna coat the entire thing. And you probably will miss some spots on the first one, like I said. That's okay, you're gonna go back and recoat it so you'll have another opportunity. If you come back and notice that you've missed some spots, don't fret, don't wig out, it's okay. It's all good. Just don't let it happen again. Just kidding. One reason I like to coat the whole thing is because I don't like to see drips. A bunch of drip lines going down the side of it, you know? Like you'll have some areas where it's like a really smooth curve like this, but then if you've got a bunch of drip lines, it just kind of takes away from that smooth curve. I try to avoid that if I can. 
That's just me though, you do you. Because really that's just, uh, I would say, more of a personal preference than anything. You can see some drips here too. So I'm going to come in and add to it. There's like drips behind there. And yeah, I even want to get behind these pieces. Because it basically just like double strengthens them from both edges, you know? I'm going to strengthen it from all sides. And okay, now that you've got your canvases all coated the way that you want, hopefully, now what you're going to do is if you want to add some color or some extra pigment, now is the time. Oh, I see some big drip lines over there. Okay, I still have resin, so I've got time. Okay. Yeah, so I don't like seeing that personally. So I will literally go in here and just use my hand, just finger paint some resin over it, and then it's gone, just like that. What I would really like to see somebody do with this, and eventually I'm gonna figure this out too, or take it far enough, is to take this spill off and actually create form out of it. Like, like almost like create surrealistic art, surrealism with this type of thing. Like, like I said earlier, like a, an animal, like make a big like shark out of this stuff or a horse or something cool, you know, like an owl. You can come up with something other than animals, but like how cool would it be to see like a massive sculpture of an owl that's made out of this colorful shit that's really just garbage, you know? I think it'd be pretty cool. Y'all know me a little bit by now and know that one of my favorite things to add to my artwork is glitter. I really love that twinkly sparkly stuff. And I think that's what I'm gonna add, so. And you also probably know by now if you've been following me for some time, one of my favorite pigment lines black diamond they make a lot of really great stuff this is the white diamond effect it's like a pearlescence essentially I'm actually using the heavier grain lux white on this it's got that really thick sparkle to it like a thick grain anyway it's glitter that's what it is okay call it pigment call it what you want this is glitter and uh yeah if you want to go buy some of their product we've got it linked down below in the description if you've never played with it before, go play with it. It's fun stuff. A little bit goes a long way too. And I just want to add it into a few places. Let it kind of ooze in to the cracks and crevices to create some interest here. This piece already has some in it, you know? Same with that. All right, now. Here's one of the last steps with this stuff. Now, I do not use a blowtorch on this stuff, ever. I don't ever, ever use a blowtorch on this stuff. Why? The reason why is it will burn the edges. To really get all the bubbles out of this stuff, all you need is a heat gun. You don't need volatility that the torch brings. And uh, I really do like to use the blowtorch, but not for this stuff. So yeah, I'm just getting all the bubbles out. I don't stay on one place for too long because the heat gun will still burn. But uh, yeah, pretty much done. And that's it. Now we let it do its thing. We let it dry and cure up and come in tomorrow. And then if we need to add more to it or decide to add more to it, we will do that. If not, call it a day sign it wire it and put it on the website for sale and then when that's all done we're going to start blasting out our sheets of new inventory which includes this as well as all the other recent collection of work that we've done with this bright color all this vivid color we'll probably blast out the whole series to certain designers probably blast it out to everybody eventually but we'll focus on more modern modern uh, interior designers and designers that tend to lean into color more than the coastal muted neutral palette stuff so yeah all right i hope y'all got some value from today's content i hope you learned some stuff if you've got any questions drop them down in the comments below 
We'll see if we can answer them and provide value. If you know any aspiring artists that can gain some value from this type of content, make sure you share it, get it out there. Uh, help us blow up this channel and come back next time. Thanks, that's it. I always love getting, uh, getting new supplies in, a new resin, and especially when it's something that I haven't used before. And I have used their paints now, but not all their colors. And they've got some really awesome colors. We got the, uh, the new fluorescent set by Golden Paints. I think they're just like fluid acrylics, essentially. What's it say? Acrylic. Heavy body. So yeah, heavy body acrylics. And I got neon on me. But these colors are super cool. This is a kit by Montana Black that comes in like 24 different cans, 24 different colors, including some of those really bright fluorescent ones. So yeah, this should be fun. These guys, I like both of those. Yeah, those are cool. We'll make sure to link all this stuff down below. You're gonna see me using it in a lot of my work. Going on a neon kit. Anyway, these, uh, these things are now, you know, pretty durable. They're cured. And you know I added a little extra hardener so these things cure faster that way. Um, at least that's what I have learned. And they still have to be cleaned up a lot. The edges are still rough. I gotta trim them. I'll probably add to the edges to round them off a bit too. But yeah, that's, uh, that's what we came up with. Honestly, they could be done, but you know, I don't wanna keep working on it, so I'm going to. But yeah, that's progress on these. And a lot of the resin that I was using the other day, like, if you want to work with this medium, you want to use it and actually start trying to bend it and get shapes out of it within the first few days after pouring it. Um, because the longer you wait, the more it cures up, the more it loses the malleability it has. Um, like a lot of these pieces that I had saved, most of these I could bend and I can still bend these a little bit, but not like yesterday. It'll probably snap too if I try to go too crazy with it. So yeah, I always like using these clear pieces too for some of the final, final touches. It just kind of adds to it. Oh, by the way, we also just got our sample prints back from the software thing we were doing with the photos for the wall panels. And we blew them up to like a 20 foot by 20 foot print size and just did a sample a little sliver of the corner of the painting like that and it seems to be really high quality for what we're trying to do with it so I was afraid we were going to have to find other options and try to go a different direction but I think we've got it figured out which is really exciting it's progress I like progress progress is Awesome. Seriously, as long as I'm seeing some progress, I'm happy. The minute that I realize that I'm not making progress, I start to feel crazy. Maybe that's uh, a character flaw. I don't know. Maybe not. But that's how I am. That's pretty much it. I'm just going to add a couple more pieces. But really, I don't know. I kind of want to actually paint with this new stuff. So I think that's what I'm going to do with the rest of the day. I've already got all the business stuff out of the way for the most part. See you next time.